Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Enough of that, enough of me, enough of you. Are you ready to get into the word of the Lord today? <laughs> Praise God. I've had the honor and the privilege, this is my third time hearing it today, so I know that God got something great and mighty in store. I know, listen, I'm telling you right now, I know that you're going to be encouraged and you're going to be uh, strengthened and ready to get out there and to, to face life the way God wants you to face life. You know, the Bible tells us that it's never the seed, is the, 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 the word of God, the seed is never the issue, it's the ground. And the ground is our hearts, our lives. So I really want to encourage you today, of all days, to really kind of slap yourself, to pinch yourself. If you've got to get into the word of God, listen up, apply it to your life. When you leave this place, don't just leave church, but take what you've got here today and use it in life. And I promise the seed of the word of God will bear fruit in your life, and I, you will never be the same. I guarantee you that right now, because God's got a great encouragement for you and for, for me today. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get down on my knees, because we don't come to church to hear from a man. We don't come to hear from a woman. You don't come to hear from an old man or a young man, a white man, a, a black man, a brown man. You don't come to hear any of that stuff. We come to hear from God. So I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer. So if you're able to stand, would you just stand as we go before the Lord in prayer? Father, we come before you today, and we're just grateful for the opportunity that we have to be in the house of the Lord. Lord, your word says, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. God, that's where we know your presence is, Father. You say, when two or more are gathered together in your midst, Lord, there you are in our presence. And Father, we thank you that you are here today. Lord, we don't come to church to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. God, we don't come to church for tradition or for entertainment. But Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. And we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church, and so Lord, in that we ask in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit would speak to us, to minister to us, to take the seed of the word of God and plant it into our hearts, into our lives, that we would leave this place and cultivate that word and bear much fruit for the kingdom of God. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us, your people, and your church. And Lord, these blessings that we ask upon ourselves, we don't ask just upon ourselves, but upon all the churches across the Inland Empire and around the world that are preaching and teaching the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. At no time do we think of ourselves or see ourselves as better than anybody else, but rather as co-laborers and brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, all working together to serve the kingdom of God and to build the kingdom of God. And we glorify you for that. So, Father, with that, we ask that you bless our Adventist brothers and sisters and our Catholic brothers and sisters, our Baptist and Presbyterian and Episcopalian and Methodist and Lutheran brothers and sisters, our Foursquare denomination brothers and sisters, our Pentecostal and Charismatics brothers and sisters. Lord, we thank you for the churches all across the Inland Empire. For Harvest, the Grove, for Sandals, for the Well and the Way, World Outreach. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for Ecclesia, for Trinity, for, uh, for Emmanuel Baptist, for Crossroads, Abundant Living. Lord, all the churches all across the Inland Empire and around the world that are preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we glorify you, we magnify you, we thank you that we are all many members of one body, the body of Christ, working together to build your kingdom. And we we'll glorify you. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, as you're being seated, if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to the book of Hebrews. For those of you who are just joining us or are resuming times off on vacation, uh, welcome back. We're glad to have you. Uh, and here we are in Hebrews in the sixth chapter. We've been going through the book of Hebrews for quite some time. We, uh, on Sunday mornings, go uh, line upon line, precept upon precept. What that means is the Bible was written that way. That's how we study it. So we've been in the book of Hebrews for quite some time. And we find ourselves in Hebrews in the 6th chapter. Now, today is going to be a great day. I'm excited for what God's got in store for you and I. But let's do some review before we get into the Word of God, before we get into the message. Let's do a little bit of recap. Let's look back at the Word of God and let's see where we've been. If you recall, in Hebrews in the 5th chapter, the author of Hebrews was speaking to the condition of the church. And if you recall, he was talking about the church should have, uh, at this point in stage of their walks with God, this church should, uh, uh, or the, the, the condition of the church should have been mature, should have had understanding, should have been able to have been a teacher or teachers of the Word of God. But rather, now they, they come back and they find that they are in need to be taught again. So the subject was maturity in the Word of God. Now, if you recall, we learned in Hebrews, the fifth chapter, about growing in maturity, growing in understanding of the Word of God. Hebrews, in the sixth uh, chapter, transitions that into maturity and moving on to perfection, the author says. Uh, moving towards that maturity or that understanding of the things of God and leaving those elementary principles behind. We discuss some of those elementary principles of the of, of of God, And then we find ourselves into that difficult subject, if you recall, of, of those who have walked away or the apostasy or the walking away or giving away of our salvation. 
and leaving that. But now in Hebrews in the 6th chapter, starting in the ninth verse, the author of Hebrews makes a transition from speaking to those who have walked away, or the subject of walking away, now to a subject of encouragement, of building, of strengthening people within the church. This message is directed to those who are in the body of Christ, to those who are in the church, and in saying so, they're directing the encouragement. Now, if you recall in Hebrews in the 6th chapter, verse number 9, it says that we are uh, confident of better things concerning you. And talking about things of salvation, the things that accompany salvation. A few weeks ago, Pastor Dan talked about the labor of our love, as well as a few weeks ago, or last week, Pastor Jim talked about the diligence in serving or diligence in working towards the, what the God's will and God's way is for our lives. So here we find ourselves in Hebrews in the 6th chapter once again. We're going to resume our study in the 11th verse. So if you've got your Bibles, go with me to Hebrews 6, uh, chapter 6, verse number 11. Hebrews 6, verse number 11 says, And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. So if you recall last week we talked about that diligence and now the subject that we turn our eyes to this week for today's message and today's uh, understanding is the full assurance of hope until the end. Now I love what the author of Hebrews says here and they state that we turn or we, we press our diligence towards the full assurance of hope. Now listen, we don't just look to or we don't just press towards hope. We don't just press towards the assurance, or let's use the word confidence of hope, but rather I love how the author of Hebrews states that we press towards, or we use, or we look towards the full assurance of hope, meaning that you and I have a hope in our lives that is unlike any hope. Now, so today the subject of our message, or this morning's message, is hope. Now, let's get an understanding. Before we can even discuss or look at hope, you and I have got to have a mature, a biblical understanding of the hope that we speak of when we talk about hope in the Bible. Now, we can say something like this, and you might have said this before, you might have thought this in your life. We could say something like, well, I hope that it will be sunny tomorrow. How about this? I can have a genuine hope. I hope that I have a million dollars deposited in my bank account tomorrow. Now, you and I know that that's a hope that's based on circumstance, that's based on wishful thinking, that's based on willful thinking, and we've all had a hope in that form or fashion in some way or another in our life. And what happens in life is when the time comes and those things that we have hoped for or those things that we have wanted to see come to pass have not, what happens is that our hope takes a hit, and now all of a sudden we find ourselves in a situation or in a, in a, in a circumstance where we have no hope or very little hope. You see, so we need to have an understanding of what the Bible says about this hope that Hebrews talks about in the 6th chapter. So with that being said, we have got to understand that hope, according to the Bible, the hope that you and I have the full assurance or the full confidence of, not just a shadowy confidence or not just a, a wishful thinking, but this hope that the Bible speaks of is a hope that is not based, listen to this, and I'm, and I'm going to say this over and over and over again today, but is a hope that is not based on circumstance or a hope that is not based on wishful or willful thinking, but rather we're going to see what this hope is based off of. So we have this hope. We sang it in the song this morning, I have a hope, and this is a hope unlike any other hope that we have in our lives. So let's get an adult, let's get a mature understanding of what the Bible says about hope, and let's look at what the Bible says about it. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Romans in the fifth chapter. Romans in the fifth chapter. Here Paul the Apostle is writing to the church at Rome. And I love this, uh, the, the, the first part of this Romans in the fifth chapter. It's a real exciting message. I'll tell you what, if it doesn't just stir the blood up in your, in your body, and if it doesn't just get the, the blood flowing for some of the things that we're talking about here, then you might want to check your pulse. Because this is some exciting things that Paul speaks to the church but he gives us a clear insight and understanding into this hope that we're talking about today. So Romans in the fifth chapter, verse number one says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Three amazing things in that verse right there. One, justification with, uh, by faith. Number two, peace with God and Jesus Christ our Lord. Three amazing things that we could all hoot and holler about all day long. But that's not even where we're going. That's just the intro. Verse number two, for though whom we have also access by faith into his, this grace, which we stand, listen to this, and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So there's this word hope again. 
Now, if you remember last week as we talked about this, uh, uh, glory is, 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 as defined and is seen in the Word of God is God's manifested goodness. So here, the, the, uh, Paul the Apostle, as he's writing to the church, says, we stand in the glory of the, uh, of the hope of the glory of God. So we stand in the hope of the manifested goodness of God. So first off, we've already seen that, we've already learned that hope is not based on circumstance. But now we see that our hope, or we stand in our hope on the glory of God or the manifested goodness of God. There's an inside, uh, inside uh, peek into where we're going is that our hope is based off of the glory or the goodness of God. There's one little step, but we don't stop there. I love this. It goes on. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. What? We glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. So we know that there are mountains and we know that there are valleys in our lives that we are going to go through. You can't escape it. The Bible says that we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but it doesn't say that we live there, camp there, build our house there. So we know that there's going to be ups and we know that there's going to be downs in life. And when we base our hope on the circumstances or the wishful or willful thinking of our own uh, uh, areas around us, we realize, because we've experienced this before, that our hope will disappoint and fail us. But here it says that tribulations produce perseverance. Perseverance produces character. And because of our character, because of the refining of our lives in God, produces a hope, a hope that's not based on the situations of life or the circumstances of life, but rather on God. But we don't stop there. We go even further than that. And this is what I love. And this is where we're here today. Now verse number five says, Now hope does not disappoint. We have all had hopes in our lives. We have all had dreams in our lives that did not come to pass. Much like how I say, I hope I get a million dollars tomorrow. Listen, I'll tell you something. I'll be honest with you. I genuinely hope I get a million dollars tomorrow. But you know what's going to happen is Monday morning's going to roll around, nothing's going to happen. Tuesday morning's going to roll around, nothing's going to happen. My hope will disappoint. But here it says that our hope does not disappoint. Why? Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by who? The Holy Spirit who was given to us. So as we see, we, we have this full assurance or this full confidence of hope in our lives that we hold fast to. We learned or we have understood that it's not based on our circumstances because that disappoints. So we see that we glory in the hope or the manifested goodness of God. So we stand in the manifested goodness of God for our hope. And then it goes on to say that our hope is not based on circumstances yet again, but now rather because the love of God has been poured out or the old, old King James says has been shed abroad into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So now the Holy Spirit has come into our lives, come into our hearts, and has established a hope that is unlike any other hope we have in our lives. Therefore, it does not disappoint. Let's go one step further. Hebrews in the 10th chapter. Now, I know we're Hebrews in the 6th chapter, so we'll, we'll get here, but it'll take a couple of years, so I think we're safe to go to Hebrews in the 10th chapter. Hebrews in the 10th chapter, verse number 23 says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. I love that. Let us hold fast. Don't let go. Don't waver. The confession of our hope. Why? For he who promised is faithful. For he who promised is faithful. So we've seen our hope is not based on circumstance. Our hope is not based on wishful or willful thinking, but rather we hope in the glory of God or in the manifested goodness of God. Our hope comes from the Holy Spirit that was shed abroad or poured into our hearts. Our hope now is based upon the word of God or the promises of God. And the Bible says that he who promised is faithful. I don't know if you realize this or you understand this, but get a hold of this. When God says something, did you know that God has a 100% track record for fulfilling the things that he said. God is not somebody or something that says some, uh, something and does not follow through with it, but rather when God says something, it comes to pass. So you see this hope, this hope that we live in, this hope that we operate in, as the author of Hebrews is speaking to the church, is not just willful thinking. Oh, I hope God's going to do something for me. 
No, 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 no. Because this hope is based on the goodness of God, the manifested goodness of God. This hope is based and brought upon and is fueled by the, the, the love of God that was poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. This hope is founded on and built on the promises and the word of God because he who promised is faithful. So I'm going to say this and I'm going to beat that dead horse all morning long. Our hope is not based on circumstance, okay? Because we got to get this. If you get anything today, get that your hope in God is not based on circumstance and situation. Why? Because you've all been, we've all been in tough situations. Hey, you might have had a bad diagnosis. Something might have happened just this week, just this day that would try to take your hope. And if your hope is based on circumstance, then you live life wondering where God is. But your hope is not based on circumstance. It's not based on diagnosis. It's not based on the health of somebody next to you or the situation of, of, of what's going on in your life. Your hope is based, founded on, fueled by God. Therefore, like Romans says, it does not disappoint. I love that Hebrew says it. Holding fast the confession of our hope, the, the word, that, that word hope defined is this, a confident expectation. Confidence is simply this, a feeling or showing certainty about something. An expectation is simply this, a strong belief that something will, listen, something will happen or, the or will be the case. Not something might happen or could be the case. A confident expectation is a feeling, a strong feeling, that something will happen or will be the case. So a confident expectation is simply this. A feeling or showing certainty about a strong belief that something will happen or be the case in the future. God will not, may not come through for you. That's not hope. I hope God does. God might come through. I pray that God would. No, 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 no. That's not a confident expectation. A confident expectation is this will be the case in my future. That this will be what is going to happen. Now let me just say this because I don't want to blow smoke and mirrors at you and tell you something and give you, give you a false understanding. Listen, the Bible says that God's thoughts are not our thoughts. God's ways are not our ways. So you know what? God's intervention and God's hand in your life may not come the way you think it's going to come. It may not look the way you think it's going to look. And it may not come at the time that you want it to come. But rest assured that the hope is based on the glory of God. The hope is founded on the promises of God. And God from this point on has never missed a promise or never not fulfilled something he said. So you can rest assured that it may not look the way you want it to, but it's going to come. That is a confident expectation. So our hope isn't based on circumstance. Our hope isn't based on the things around us, but rather our hope is based on God. So this morning, we're going to talk about three things that we have a hope for. Three things that we have a hope for. Number one, we have a hope for, number one, a better life. We have a hope for a better life. You know what that means? That means when life comes at us, that means when things like depression want to get at us, when anxiety wants to come at us, when the pressures of life, when things try to get us down, when the attacks of the enemy and the devil try to bring us down, when the words of our peers or our thoughts try to get us down, you and I can rest assured that is the will of God that we have a hope for a better life. And we don't have to let depression, anxiety, worry, situations come at us because God says, I have got something great planned for you. You've got a great life in store for you. I love what John the 10th chapter says. John the 10th chapter. Verse number 10 says, the thief doesn't come but to steal, kill, and destroy. But I love Jesus' rebuttal. He says, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Do you know who they is? Us! That's right, you and me. Jesus said that I have come that we would have life. And I love how he doesn't just stay there. Hey, listen, I would be happy if he would have just left it at I came that they would have life. Because the life of God is better than the life anywhere else in the world. But Jesus wants to add some more to it. He says, I came that they would have life. And he doesn't just say, I would came that they would have life and that they would have abundant life. No, he wanted to strategically add that extra, uh, extra description that they would have life, not just in abundance, but in more abundance. Because God's desire is for us to have a better life. God's desire for you is to have a better life. You say, Pastor, look, you know, I'm going through some things right now. My life stinks. 
Well, guess what? There is a hope, a confident expectation. You might be in the valley of the shadow of death, but it is God's intent, it is God's design, and God's desire that you get through it. In Jesus' name. We have a confident expectation for a better life. I like what Ephesians, the second chapter, says. If you got your Bibles, go with me to Ephesians, the second chapter. Ephesians, in the second chapter, verse number 11. Ephesians, the second chapter, verse number 11. Paul's reminding the church at, at Ephesus, kind of giving them a little heads up, kind of bringing them back to where they were. He says, verse number 11, he says, Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by what is called circumcision, made by the flesh and hands, you were once outsiders by those who were on the inside. Verse number 12 goes on to say, That at a time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope. With, and without God in the world. Has anybody ever been window shopping before? Have you ever gone window shopping? You know, you know, you, you broke, you ain't got no money, but you say, well, I got nothing else to do, so I'll just go look at the things that I can't afford, but I want? <laughs> Very simple explanation is, there was a time for you and I in our lives when we were just simply window shopping with God. That there was something in between us and God, that we were on the outside looking in, that we lacked hope in God. But I love that verse number 13 comes along and it says, but now. You see, that was then, this is now. Now all of a sudden, but now in Christ Jesus, you, were once who, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You know what that means? That you were once window shopping. And then all of a sudden, the concierge of that store opened the door by the name of Jesus Christ and came out and said, Hey, I noticed you're on the outside looking in. Come on in and try it on. Because now you're not on the outside looking in, but now you're on the inside. In the family of God. I love what FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, said. He said that when life gets tough, when you get to the bottom of your rope, tie a knot and hang on. When you get to the bottom of your rope, tie a knot and hang on. You know, sometimes in life, it's the only thing that keeps us going is hope. But thank God our hope is not based on circumstance. Thank God our hope is not based on the things around us. But now all of a sudden we get to the bottom of that rope and we tie a knot. And you know what that knot is? Our hope. And guess what? That knot is a very big knot. You know, like back in the day when you used to swing on a tree. Remember that? You'd tie a rope from a tree and you put like a two by four and sit on it. You don't even have to tie a knot. Put a seat on the bottom of that rope. Why? Because your hope is not just the knot at the bottom of the rope. Your hope is the fact that there's a hand of God that holds the top of the rope and it is pulling it up one over another. You have a hope. We have a hope for a better life. Look, look what it says in 1 Thessalonians. It says, Let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. That confident expectation. Life's going to come at you. It's going to try to deal you fatal blows. It's going to come and try to rob you of your hope. The enemy's going to come and try to steal the hope of God from you. But the Bible says to put on as a protection, a covering from that fatal blow of life, the helmet of salvation, the hope of salvation. Which means that hope is that knot at the bottom of the rope that you and I have somewhere better to go. That even though our life may be down in the dumps or we might be dismal, we can rest assured and begin to say what the Bible says about us. And our hope is that Jesus came to give us life and more abundantly. So when depression seeks in, when anxiety seeks in, or when, it, uh, when, when the troubles of life come in, you can say, nope. That's not what God's got in store for me. That's not what God has for me. But rather, I've got life, and I've got a better life ahead of me in Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. We're talking about things we have hope for. Things we have hope for. Number two, we have a hope for. Number two, a bigger life. A bigger life. You see, God's intent is that we have a better life and also a bigger life, which means a life that is well lived as well as well effective. God's desire for us is to not just live this life in existence and get through it, but rather to have a bigger life, a life of fulfillment, a life of effective, effectiveness. 
wherever we go, that we would shine the glory of God. Our God's intent for us is to expand our territory, to not be who we were yesterday, today, but rather to continue to grow and to see and to change in the ways and the will and the thoughts of God, that the, the glory of God would transform us in our lives. Jim Elliot said, I seek not a long life, but a full one, like you, Lord Jesus, Lord and Savior. Some 33 years of life, but yet had a full, had an effective life. Imagine what we could do if we lived a bigger life. A life that had a reason. A life that had a purpose. A life that was blessed. Not just so that we could ourselves be blessed, but rather so that we could be a blessing to others around us. I look, look what it says in Isaiah, the 54th chapter. It says, sing, O barren. Verse number one. You who have not born, break forth into singing and cry aloud. You who have not labored with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Verse number two, enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Don't spare, lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes. You shall expand to the right, to the left. Your descendants will inherit the nations and make desolate the cities inhabited. You know what God's saying to the people? This is written at the lowest state of the people of God. They were in exile some 700 years before Jesus even came. God knew that Jesus would come and fling open the doors of salvation. And now this remnant that once existed would now bring and carry the ways of billions and trillions of people to come into the kingdom of God for eternity. And God is saying to the church, Open the doors. Expand. We're talking about tents and cords. Look at this. It's saying add on. Build on. you got more room coming. It is God's intent and desire for the church to grow. It is God's intent and desire for you and I to expand. You see, I say the church to grow. I'm not talking about the building. You know, 12 years ago, this church was 12 people. Or 25 years ago, this church was 12 people in a box of Kleenex. Now thousands on a weekend. But that's just the building. You see, you are the church. You are the church. And it is God's design and desire for the church to expand from the north, the south, the east, and the west to live a bigger life. We've got to get a hold of it. We have a hope that this today, where we're at, you might be successful. You might be tremendously in failure right now. It doesn't matter. Today is not where God has designed and desired for you to be. God has bigger things in store for your life. I love what God says to Abraham in Genesis, the 12th chapter. In Genesis, the 12th chapter, verse number one, he tells Abraham to get out of the land of your fathers to a land I'll show you. Verse number two, he kind of gives him the reasons why, the benefits. He says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great. Listen, let me just be open. Let me just be honest with you right now. I don't know about you. I want to be blessed. I want to be blessed. Hey, I would like to have my name great. And I don't want to focus on one thing, you know, and get so focused on the prosperity message that I miss everything else. But let me tell you something. I don't, want to, I don't want to forsake one area of my life either. I want to be blessed in all areas of my life. And God says to Abraham, I will bless you. I will make your name great. But you know, he doesn't just tell Abraham, I'm going to give you good stuff. I'm going to give you good possessions. Why? He says, I will bless you. I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. You see, God's intent for us is to have a bigger life so that when people look at us, they say, wow, something's going on about you. You've got a quality of life that doesn't make any sense. You've got something going on. It just seems like favor keeps coming your way, and I can't figure it out what it is. He said, well, let me tell you about this hope that I have that you can have too. You see, and God's intent is for us to have a bigger life so that those around us would see it and grab a hold of it. A better life, number one. A bigger life. Number two. Number three, we have a hope for. Oh, this, this one, if you don't get excited about this one, you might want to just stop for a moment, put your finger up to your neck, and check to see you got a pulse. Okay? Because this is it right here. This is the hope that we have. We have a hope, number three, for an everlasting life. For an everlasting life. You see, oftentimes we wonder, oh, man, I wonder what it's going to be like. What's that transition going to go from, from, from here to eternity? Did you realize, I don't know if you get it, you are in the transition time. 
The Bible tells us that the life that we live right now in this flesh and bones, this 60, 80, uh, 70, 90 years, whatever we live, this is the transition time. The Bible describes it as vapor time, like a, like a mist of water that goes and disappears and within a second. This is the, the vapor time of our lives. And the hope is that not that we live a good 60, 70, 80 years. No, 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 no. That's fine. That's great. That's the transition. But now, all of a sudden, our hope, our confident expectation that it will come to pass or it will be is that we will be with God in paradise, in heaven for eternity. Whoa! We think of the term eternity. Because of our finite minds, it's hard for us to get that around. So we start thinking, we start putting zeros behind years. Oh, maybe it's like a thousand years or a million years. Or, or, I mean, America seems like it's been around forever. It's only been here for like 250 years. Eternity has no end. We can't even comprehend it. And here we have a hope, a confident expectation, not based on circumstance, not based on the things around us, but rather based on the promises, the glory, and the goodness of God that we will spend eternity when we are in the family of God, when we are brought into the family and ones who are on the outside are now on the inside, now all of a sudden our hope is that we will spend eternity with God. And this time that we are here right now is just a transitional time. This is just a transitional time. Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present for the Lord. Paul also said that to, to live is Christ and to die is gain. I like what it says in 1 Thessalonians in the fourth chapter. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep or died, lest you sorrow as others who have had no hope or who have no hope. You see, you and I have a hope that tomorrow is a better day, whether we're here or in Christ in heaven. Tomorrow is a better day. We don't have to sorrow. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, there have been people in my life that have died that I wasn't sure where they went. To get where they went. I'm not sure. Let me tell you something. I don't know, and, and God's the judge of that. But God is not, is God not just and merciful? Is God not a just and a righteous God? You know, you think of it like this, a little bit of hope for you. Is that, you know, you think about it like this. The man on the cross next to Jesus simply said a very easy statement. And all of a sudden, on the last moments of his life, found himself in paradise with Jesus Christ. And those people that you don't know about, hey, you don't know what happened in the last seconds of their life. The fact of the matter is, though, for you and your own life and those that you can affect while you're here, you can share the hope of Jesus Christ and you can rest assured that when you leave this place, ain't nobody got to cry for you. Why? Because you're the lucky one. I remember all my life growing up with Pastor Jim, Pastor Deborah. People would die in the church that were founded in the church, that were leaders in the church, that were involved in the church, and they'd get the call. So-and-so passed away, and everybody would be so heartbroken. Oh, they'd be crying. Pastor Jim and Pastor Deborah would, woohoo! And everybody would look at them, man, why are you guys so hard? Man, we used to get on them. You need to be a little bit more sensitive. What they did is they had Paul's understanding. They don't sorrow for those who have no hope, as those who have no hope. Why? Because they know that that person who passed from death to life is now no longer here on the sea. You see, this is the transition. You can't put your hope in, in material. Why? You're going to buy a new car. It's going to smell good. Oh, don't you love that new car smell? But you, smell those, you spill those French fries and that, that new car smell's gone. You park it in the parking lot of Target, something's going to ding at your door. Hey, you bought that new shiny house and then all of a sudden the market went upside down. You, you lost it all. You can't put your hope in that. But now all of a sudden your hope is not in that, but now in Jesus Christ. And now you say, listen, I don't got to worry about door dings. I don't got to worry about money. I don't got to worry about homes. Why? Because now I'm in the presence of God for all eternity. The lucky ones. Oh, there's a hope for you and I, church. I love what, what it says. We'll conclude with this. In the New Living Translation, I'll just put it up on the overhead in 1 Corinthians in the 15th chapter. It says, then our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die. The scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. You see, heaven is perfect. Heaven is, the New King James says, incorruptible. Yet our bodies are imperfect. Our bodies are, in, are, are corruptible. You want a proof of corruptible bodies? Look what gravity does over time. <laughs> Somehow... We are born and we got that nice, tight, soft skin. And then somehow the older we get, the more we get of it. 
Those spots start showing up all over the place. Things start getting lower on our body. Our hair starts going higher. Why? Because our bodies are corruptible, decaying as we speak. And heaven cannot receive a corruptible in something that is incorruptible. So the Bible tells us that when we pass from this to the next, our bodies will be transformed into perfect, incorruptible. And now all of a sudden, the scripture will be fulfilled. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to fear what happens when we die because we have a confident expectation that it will come to pass that when we leave this place, we will be in the presence of God. And now all of a sudden, our bodies that are sagging, that are hurting, that are filled with pains and, and suffering and negativity, now all of a sudden will be made perfect in the eyes of God. And now the sting of death and, and, and sin will no longer have a hold of us. I love that. Oh, death, where is your victory? The new King James says, oh, Hades, where is your sting? Look what it goes on to say, verse number 56. For the sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives it its power. I love verse 57. But thank God, thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So my dear brothers and sisters... Be strong, immovable. Do you remember how Hebrews said, be steadfast, hold on, don't waver. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord. For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. So this hope that you and I have, let's bring it all together. This hope that you and I have, God has a better life in store for you. God has a bigger life in store for you. Why? So that you could shine the glory of God so that when you pass from here to eternity, you can look back and say, wow, the things that I did in this life with my better and my bigger life from God had an eternal effect on somebody next to me. And you can turn around in eternity and say, wow, that person's here because of me. And that person brought that person and that person, that person, and that person. And all of a sudden, look and see the millions that are affected because of your work here on earth because of the hope that you and I have. Now, I'll conclude with this. I've quoted a famous president. I've quoted a missionary martyr. Now, let me conclude and bring it all together and let me quote to you a movie star. Some of the guys in the house, you're going to know, you're going to like this because it's, it's a man quote. It's from a man movie. But you remember Russell Crowe in that movie about being a gladiator? You remember what he said to his fellow soldiers? He said, brothers, what we do in life echoes in eternity. What we do in this vapor time, church, echoes in eternity because we have a hope and we share that hope with as many as we can and we bring them into the hope of the glory of Jesus Christ. And now we look back in heaven and through our eternity and we can see the millions that have been affected just from our effort because of our hope. A study published in the Oxford Journal showed that happy people, happy people, the average male who's happier lives 16 years longer. The average woman who's happy lives 23 years longer. Pastor Dan quoted this, said that the world tries to add life to your years. Years to your life. I just said it wrong. The world tries to add life, years to your life. We see this, it's called plastic surgery. <laughs> but God adds life to your years. God adds life to your years. You and I have a hope. Not a hope that it will be sunny tomorrow. Not some vain hope that will disappoint, but rather a hope that's not based on circumstance. A hope that's based on the glory of God, that's poured into us from the love of God by the Holy Spirit, that is founded on the promises of God because God is faithful when he speaks to come through. We have a hope that we can have a bigger life, a better life, and an everlasting life. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord today? Well, listen, let me do one more thing. I want to ask everybody, please remain seated. Thank you for those of you that didn't get up and leave. I appreciate you so much. Let me do one more thing. Give me a few more moments of your attention. Let me ask you a very important question today. You know, we talked about the hope of eternal life, and I want to ask you, and I want to address the, the, the question is, the Bible says that a man ought to examine himself from time to time. Let me ask you this question. You answer it within your own heart. If you were to leave this place today and you were to die, heaven forbid that be the case, would you find yourself in heaven? Would you find yourself in hell? You know, it's a relatively simple question, but nobody's going to know that answer except you and God. 
Did you know that you can't hope or think or want or wish your way into heaven? Like, I hope it's going to rain tomorrow. I hope I go to heaven. I'm sorry, that's not the kind of hope we're talking about today. You can't think or hope or wish or want your way into heaven. There, knowing the Bible doesn't say that God's going to look at you and say, well, they wanted it bad enough. They thought that they were going to get there, so I'll let them in. There's more to it than that. No, did you know that nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you weren't raised as a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Muslim or any other type of world or religion or philosophical thought that you're going to get to heaven by default or by classification? You can't get to heaven that way. It's just not the way you get there. Do you know that nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because your parents took you to church on Christmas or because you went to church on Easter, they told you you were a Christian because you wear a cross or St. Christopher around your neck that you're going to go to heaven? Nowhere does it say that. You can't get to heaven because you're baptized or christened as a baby, because your parents told you you were a Christian, or because you go to church on Christmas or Easter, or you're even here today. You don't get to heaven that way. You might say, well, I always thought that I was a good person. Good people go to heaven. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that good people go to heaven? Yet we, so many people believe that if all we do is live a good life, like the tooth fairy, we're going to get to heaven, you know, something like that. I'm sorry. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you have good deeds, because you've never robbed a 7-Eleven, because you don't drive too fast on the freeway. Nowhere does it say that because you do good things, you give to charitable organizations, mean you're going to get to heaven. The Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God, are like filthy rags. Nothing you and I could ever do on our own, through our own good works, would ever make us good enough to get to heaven, because it's not about good works. The truth is, is that there's no way you and I can get to heaven except God's way. Why? Because it's God's heaven. The only way you and I can get there is God's way, regardless of how we think or regardless of what we believe. It's God's heaven. It's God's way. And the only way we can get there is his own way. And Jesus Christ said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one goes to the Father except through him. So today, there's no other way to get to heaven except God's way. And here it is. Jesus was speaking to a religious leader of his day, a man who had memorized scriptures out of the Bible, a man who had taught the word of God, who had given to the poor, done all the right things, wore all the right clothes, said all the right things. You would think that as they discussed the subject of eternal life, that Jesus would pat this man on the back and tell him, you just keep on going. But rather, Jesus says to him, gives us the formula and the way to get to heaven. And that is that he says to Nicodemus, the religious leader of his day, you must be born again. That's it. There it is. There's no other way. Now, you've heard that term, you think of Hollywood and popular culture, society's definition of that, that it's radical, crazy, weirdo, out of control Christianity. Listen, I don't care what Hollywood says, they have no concept of God. Born again from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible has always meant the same thing in the eyes of God. Here it is. Are you ready? It means that you've given God all of your heart, you've given God all of your life. That's it. There it is. God's after all of your heart, he's after all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with God. It's not about your mental ascent or your carnal knowledge of who God is. You know, the Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who God is, yet they're not going to get to heaven. The Bible shows us that in the wilderness, the devil was able to quote scriptures to Jesus. Yet, because he knows scripture doesn't mean he's going to get into heaven. It's not about your carnal ascent or your mental knowledge of who God is. But rather, it's about all of your heart. It's about all of your life. That's what God's after today. Let me prove it to you in the Word of God. In the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Jesus Christ is speaking to the church and he says, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because he says, if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Wow. Shocking, rude, crude statement out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. And what Jesus is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all and will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. But what does lukewarm mean? Let's define that in terms of your relationship means that you're a little bit up, a little bit down, a little bit in, a little bit out, occasional church attendance, token prayer, doing some of your own thing, doing some of God's thing. You're not wholehearted for God, but you're not wholehearted against God. You like to say it like this, riding the fence. You're kind of ping-ponging back and forth with God. And Jesus says that if that's you, you're deceived in thinking you're going to make it into heaven. You can't get there that way. The only way that we can get there is God's way. You might even say, well, Pastor Luke, that's great. I appreciate your effort. You find God your way, I'll find God my way. We'll all get there. You know, that's like saying all roads lead to the moon. I'm sorry. No, way you, no matter which way you cut it, no leads lead to, lead to the moon. And you can't get to heaven your way, can't get to heaven my way. The only way we can get there is God's way. You know, you might even say, well, I don't know that heaven's real or hell's real. That's, that's between you and God. But let me tell you something. Just because you don't believe that heaven or hell is real doesn't mean it's not. That's like saying I don't believe in semi-trucks, yet you go and stand on the slow lane of the freeway and you'll meet one face to face. I love you enough. I respect you enough. I honor you enough to not beat around the bush, to tell you the truth, to tell you like it is. You can't get to heaven your own way. The only way we can get there is God's way, and that's with all of your heart, with all of your life. Well, how do we do it? Jesus said that if you confess him before men, he'll confess you before my, his father. But if you deny him before men, he will deny you before his father. So let's not do it any other way today but God's way. Here's what I'm going to do in just a moment. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to smack my hand on my Bible. Three, just like that. And if that's you in this place, I want to give you the opportunity 
to get to know Jesus, to ensure your place in heaven. What I want you to do when I count to three is I want you to pop your hand up. What you're doing is you're acknowledging, you say, Pastor Luke, I want to give him all my heart. I want to give Jesus Christ all my life. I want to go to heaven. I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You put your hand right back down. You say, Pastor Luke, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that. I'm going to be embarrassed. You know what? You might be, but that's okay. Get over it for a moment and give him all of your heart. Give him all of your life. It's better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell. You see, God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way. He's already done everything he could to ensure you get to heaven. Why? Because hell was never designed for you. It was designed for the devil and his angels. And God's done everything he could by giving his only begotten son, his most valuable possession, Jesus Christ, to die a beaten, bloody mess on the cross for you and I so that we could give him, in turn, our heart and our lives. The decision's yours. Who should raise their hand? Well, if you've never given him your heart, you've never given him your life, in just a moment, if that's you, pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. Who should raise their hand? Maybe you're not sure. Well, make sure today. Don't leave this place without making sure. You know, that's a gamble on your eternal life that you can't afford to make. Don't leave today without making sure. Maybe you did this at a Harvest or a Billy Graham Crusade or something like that or on TV, but you never really followed through with it. Today, if that's you, pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. We'll go forward from there. Who should raise your hand? If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing today, if that's you, let's stop playing games with God, stop messing around with God, and let's ensure your place in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever for eternity. The decision's yours. Let's go hot for Jesus Christ today. Just pop your hand up when I count to three, and if that's you, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it. You can put your hand right back down. We'll go forward from there. All over this place, all over this auditorium, if that's you, get ready. The moment of your salvation is here, whether you're watching online or in the foyer, in the Love Rock Cafe, wherever you're at. If that's you, you hear the sound of my voice, I want you to stop what you're doing and get ready because the moment of your salvation is now. Don't miss this opportunity. Don't walk out of this place without making sure today is the day of your salvation. I'm going to count to three in, in, in this place. In just a moment, if that's you, get ready. Pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it on the count of three. We'll go forward from there. Today is your day. Here we go. Ready? One, two, Three. Let me see your hands in this place. I see one, two, three. Hold on, hold on. Three, four, five. Five wise people. If that's you, let me see your hand. If you popped your hand up, I didn't see them all. Five wise people right over there. I got you back there. Five wise people. Anybody else? Six, I see you. If that's you in this place. Seven, I see that hand over there. Seven wise people over here. Where are you guys at? Let me see your hands. If you pop your hand up, let me see it. Come on. I see the ushers pointing over here. Where are you at? Just give me a little wave. I see you, my friend. Eight wise people. Nine over there in the back. I see that hand. Ten, I see that hand. 11, I see those. 12, I see that. 12 wise people. Anybody else in the family rooms, wherever you're at, if that's you in this place, let me see your hand today. 13, I see you in the family room. One in the family room, right? 13. Where are you at, number 14? Where are you at, number 15? I, I, where, where, let me see. Give me a little wave so I can see. I see you, 14. Where are you at, number 15? Say, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. Come on, if that's you. You say, man, I wonder if this guy's ever going to shut up. Maybe it's time for you to raise your hand and stop playing games with God. Anybody else in this place today? 14 wise people, come on, you know you want to do this. Stop playing games with God. Let's go forward in your relationship with God. I didn't embarrass them. I'm not going to embarrass you. Come on, where are you at, number 15? I know you're in this place. I know you're saying, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. Come on. If that's you in this place, go and pop your hand up. Let me see it. I'll acknowledge it. Put it right back down. Anybody else today? Anybody else in this place today? I'm going to close it up right now. I see the ushers pointing. Where are you at? I got you, 15. Hey, praise God for 15 wise people. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Hey, listen, for the 15 of you, maybe the five of you that didn't raise your hand, the 20 of you all together that didn't raise your or that, that raised your hand or should have raised your hand, listen, I want to ask you to be bold. In a moment, we're going to stand together. Elijah's going to sing a song. I want you to be bold. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, your friend if you need a friend, whether you're in the family room, the back, the front, wherever you're at. You said you were going to give them all your heart. Remember, I said you acknowledge that. You don't give them your heart. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You acknowledge that. You give him your heart by giving, by asking him to be the Lord and Savior of your life. Let us pray with you. We want to help you. We want to get some things in your hand. If you're serious about giving your heart, giving your life to Jesus Christ, in a moment as we stand together, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, a Bible, a friend if you need a friend. He brought somebody or somebody came with you. Bring them with you and get out of your seat, get out of your chair and come meet me here at the altar and let's change destinies together. As we stand together, please, nobody leave. And if that's you, if you raise your hand, you come forward. Come on, let's change destinies together. That's you, come on. Wherever you're at, you come. He will die for me. Amazing love, I know true. Come on, you can come. That's you. It's my joy to love me. Thank you, guys.
guys. Hey, listen, today you're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration. Today is the first day of the rest of your life, all right? Today's a good day. Here's what we're going to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here waving at you? This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really cool guy. Nothing weird goes on. I pro Listen, I'm as weird as it gets, okay? You endured me. You got through it, okay? Pastor Joel is going to take you right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, so we're going to help you with that. He's going to give you some free literature, some stuff that our senior pastor wrote to help you. It's real easy reading to help you get strong in the, in the ways of God. You just get saved and say, now what do I do? Well, we want to help you with that. The last thing he's going to do is he's going to give you a friend. We give away friends here at the church. They're called spiritual personal trainers. Somebody that will meet with you right before service, right over there in Love Rock Cafe. Come a little bit early. They'll buy you a cup of coffee. They'll sit down with you, show you some things in the Bible to help get you strong so you don't go back to the life that you just came from and you go strong and go forward in your relationship with God. So we're going to give them to you. So if you guys would just turn to your left, my right, go right over here with Pastor Joel. <laughs> Praise God. Woo! Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son, and that you sent him for me, and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.